run a low-pitched musical manner is usually loudest at the apex and left channel border. What's going on? Pastor Brent here. I'm sitting here with my buddy, Pastor Josh. Uh, we are at his round table. It's been a few months since we've done one of these. We took the summer off because this room gets blazing hot in the summer. And also, uh, we wanted to have a little break and not just have a conversation to have one, but we felt like it was time to start doing them again. And God has lined some things up. We've we've had some great guests so far. This is episode yeah. five. We d- uh, started with episode zero. Then we did, uh, we did one with um, DJ Daryl mm-hmm. and... DJ Dimension, and then we we did Mike and Courtney Warden, and last time we did our friends from the Navajo Reservation. Who else? Am I John McCatton. John McCatton came, and then we did uh, one with Callie mm-hmm. and uh, Charlie. Mm-hmm. We did an intercession one, and so now we have the opportunity to sit here with a, a good friend with so much history with the Babels, and we've gotten to know her a little bit. And so this morning we or this afternoon we get to sit here with her and talk some more and get to know her more. Her name is Barb Jackson. Thank mm-hmm. you for being here with us. Josh, you want to tell us a little bit about? Yeah, so um, I, I really felt as we get ready to conclude this year, our hope is to do a couple to end the year and then kind of see what God wants to do next year with these. But I was really feeling to, to round out this year um, to really begin to speak on, um, you know, of what's passionate to us. And one of the thing, key things that I believe is needed and necessary as we begin to navigate going forward um, with our relationship with God, number one, but more importantly, how we are to navigate our lives in a culture that has so many voices and so many um, avenues that, that, that allow us to be distracted. Um, and I, I, I kind of wanted to just start off by, by talking about the, the idea that in John chapter 10 and verse 27, we know that Jesus looked as the Pharisees began to say, he says, you're not my sheep. And I know this because my sheep know and hear my voice. And there, I believe that, that there was a key element in to know and hear my voice. And, and there's no way to actually dive into that scripture, whether it's in the Greek, if you want to even go to the roots of the Hebrew, to where hear my voice doesn't mean hear my voice. Um, the word voice there doesn't mean word and can be translated into just written word. There is this aspect of the voice. And we understand that, that as time progressed, Jesus looked at his disciples and said, I must go so that I can send another to you. And that it is good that I go because it's important. Well, we all know now with our hindsight 2020, we know that the Holy Spirit was sent in the book of Acts. And Paul begins to discuss this and and really dive into the Holy Spirit and and one of the main purposes of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians um, uh, chapter 12. And we know that it starts off in that regard. And I I just kind of want to set the tone by reading it here. Um, And in 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, we know that he begins to talk about um, now concerning spiritual gifts. Brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware You know that when you were pagans, you used to be enticed and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are different gifts, but the same Holy Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. And there are different activities, but the same God works all of them in each person. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good of everyone in the brethren. To one is given a message of wisdom to through the Spirit, another a message of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the performing of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another distinguishing between spirits and discernment, and to another different kinds of tongues and a gift of interpretation of tongues. One and the same spirit is active in all of these, distributing to each person as he wills. And what I under have come to understand and why I felt it so important to have Reverend Prophet Barb Jackson with us is I learned the importance and the value of having 
the intimacy of being able to hear God's voice through prophecy, but even just deeper than just getting a prophetic word, but being able to hear God's voice, the, the, the rhema word of God, hearing him inside um, through her, um, her ministry and her dedication and her sacrifice and what she gave her life to was she did not want the body of Christ to go without being able to hear their shepherd because the understanding is that we will know who our shepherd is when we hear his voice. And so I did, I, I honestly, with many discussions and, and prayer throughout the summer, I wanted to start with Barb and I wanted her to begin to lay the found, you know, the foundation of this inside of our hearts and be able to just tell us and tell everybody listening a little bit about that. But also just to, to, hear from you barb also just your testimony your life your you've done so much and have such a deep relationship with god um that that for generations this needs to be known and the example that you are you're a general in the faith and and you've sacrificed so much and have impacted so many and 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 though we may be doing this in a little bit different technology type setting but it's the same spirit that lives inside of you to begin to impact not just who you've already but through the generations going forward that is your inheritance and i wanted to give the opportunity for that to be seen so that's the vision of today and when and so we're so happy that you're here we're so thankful that you took the time to to come and be with us and 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 take the sacrifice on on this day to come and be with us and so we're honored to have you here barb well, thank you so much for inviting me. And the main thing about anything like this that uh, that I speak at is number one to give all glory to Jesus. Yeah. And and the cross that he he bore upon his body, that we can be called the sons of God, and we can hear his voice. And so yes, it is my passion. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I don't know where really to start, but uh, what? how about we start in my mother's womb? Yeah, let's go. She mm -hmm. and my father prayed and dedicated all five of us kids to the Lord for the service of God. Mm -hmm. And we were raised Baptist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then when I was about 12 years old, uh, my mother went to a meeting and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, what you'd call Pentecost, Acts 2, and uh, everything changed in our household, and pretty soon we left the Baptist church by way of the uh, left foot of fellowship. Oh, boy. Uh, because my mother was a very strong believer and had a great relationship with mm. Christ. And uh, so we attended another church that uh, was not yet Pentecostal, but seeking to be. And the name of the pastor was Charles McHatton mm -hmm. huh. and uh, his four boys. Uh, I was uh, an instigator uh, <laughs> of uh, wildness that they didn't permit in their household. And uh, so after a few years, when I hit my... Uh, real rebellion, you know, because in the Baptist church, it was like, you go to church or you die. And uh, so we were many times uh, threatened to be beat out of bed if we didn't get up and go to church. Yeah. <laughs> I think and some kids need that again too. today. And, and, <laughs> I, <laughs> and, and so it was a very important thing in our family to attend church and to believe on Christ and to accept him into our heart. But when we changed to the church named Gospel Echoes, mm -hmm. uh, I was just hitting my rebellion time. Uh, I'd had an incident in my life where I, I had chose a profession that I wanted to do and uh, that dream of mine was crushed. Uh, basically my parents said, we don't want you doing that and so they took my dream away is the way I looked at it. Mm -hmm. Now afterwards, you know, it's kind of like when, when the Lord says that the children of Israel saw the acts of God, but Moses knew the ways of God. Hmm. Uh, I didn't understand the ways of my parents. <laughs> uh, yeah. I saw what they were doing and it hurt <laughs> mm -hmm. both ways. 
And uh, that's when I decided that if this is the way it's going to be, then everything they've ever told me not to do, I'm going to do. Going to get blamed for it anyway. Uh, I had an older brother that already been there back, and uh, so I had a good teacher. And so for really about uh, age 14 all the way up to when I got saved at 20, I ran from the Lord. I ran from anything to do with the Bible. But I was looking, I was searching, and that's what this generation is doing. They're reaching out. They don't have the same background. And so they're searching for something. At least I had the beginning of the foundation. Baptist people, they preach the word. Yeah, yeah. I remember going to uh, the church when I was about nine, and they were having camp, and I was old enough to go to the, you know, the summer camp. But it cost a lot of money, and my parents, my dad was a, uh, he went to Bible college, and he was an evangelist when we first came out here when I was five years old. Mm -hmm. uh, when the family started growing, he, we couldn't live, and so he had to leave the ministry and go and work. But uh, there were times when I wanted to go to camp. We didn't have the money. And so the camp came up with this, camp director came up with this, that if you could quote 300 verses over the, you know, the Christmas all the way up to the summer camp, then we'll let you go free. Well, I wanted to go to camp so bad, not necessarily because it was Christian, just I wanted to go to camp, you know. And uh, so I did. I started memorizing scripture. I'd already had a head start from my dad. He used to stand us up in the cotton fields out here in Arizona when I was five years old, six years old, and he would have me and my brother sing, oh, the windows of heaven are open, <laughs> you know, and uh, the blessings are coming tonight. And then we would sing until people, you know, heard the message, and then they would get saved, so many, because that was my dad's heart. And uh, as kids, we, we kind of enjoyed it at first, but after a while, it was pushed on us. Yeah. And, and now that's one thing I think we need to realize is that you can't push somebody into, well, here's the old adage. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I heard the voice of the Lord one day say, oh, yes, you can. I said, well, how? He says, put salt on their tongue. Wow. And then the scripture that we are light and salt, you know, was made real to me that that as a city sitting upon a hill, we don't put our light under a bushel, mm -hmm. but we are to be a walking testimony in everything that we do and say for the Lord Jesus Christ, and that we build that relationship with him as we walk with him and talk with him. Yeah. Well, I'm jumping all over the place well, over that the was first good. That was 12 good. to 13 sure. years, but uh, the rebellion set in. But that year, I memorized 300 verses. <laughs> of course, I started with Jesus wept. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I got uh, that one. <laughs> you know, it seems like we all know that one. But a very profound verse. <laughs> oh, very much, very much. It's easy, but profound. Of course, at, at the same time, we didn't didn't understand it. Sure. But okay, I, here's birth verse number one. Got it down, <laughs> and and I did, and I didn't realize the memory that God had given me at birth, because my brother was an A student, and he was well, kind of like you, Josh, the firstborn. And he just, he could ace everything without studying. He didn't even crack a book. And so here I come along, and I'm stumbling over every subject that I have to do until I realize that God had given me a memory, and I could memorize the Bible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the Bible at that time was the book. It, we knew it was the Word of God, the Holy Bible. But... I didn't understand until years later when I gave my heart to God, and I won't go as to how deep we went into sin, we all sinners, from the time we opened our mouth at birth, mm -hmm. but I had an encounter with Jesus. 
that changed my life. It wasn't about the faith of my fathers at the time. It was about my relationship. Mm -hmm. And yet it was a generational pass down. I found out years later that on my mother's side, there were three or four Pentecostal women preachers. And that my mother's real dad, that she'd only seen four or five times in her life, was an apostolic, you know, Pentecostal preacher. And one day my mother and I, we traveled all the way back to Kentucky uh, to kind of visit our ancestors that were in the grave, mm -hmm. <laughs> if you know what I mean. Check all the gravestones and the dates and see how we're related before ancestry came. And uh, when we found his grave, the town was basically a ghost town. It wasn't even there anymore, a little bitty town in Kentucky. But the cemetery was still there. Mm. And so we went, and on his gravestone, my, my real grandfather, Charles Underwood was his name, it said, here lies an apostolic preacher wow. of mm. the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the heritage was there. Yeah. The generations were there. And not even knowing it, here the call of God is placed upon the children of my parents. At birth, they dedicate us to the work and service of the Lord. Now, before my older brother passed away, he did find the Lord. But he rebelled also. So I'm going to now fast forward. I'm over the rebellion. Uh, I'm in over my head with a group of people that could have killed me. Mm. And I want to I want to paint that picture. We don't have to jump into it, but I think this is absolutely hilarious. Like when I think about Barb, like <laughs> I see Barb sitting here and and you would see her. She was in a biker gang. OK, she was well, in a bike. <laughs> <laughs> we broke bikes. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> And, Anyways, uh, I just think that's hilarious. It, that's yeah, awesome. it was not good. And so <laughs> it got to the place where emptiness was setting in and everything. Yeah. The thrill of, uh, you know, riding with bad people and doing the things that I was always thought never to do, uh, it was starting to really sink in. And there was an emptiness in my heart. And uh, so I, I drove from Arizona, from Phoenix, up to Prescott to go to a camp. Now, there wasn't a camp on the campgrounds. It was just an empty campground. Mm -hmm. There's about 20 or 30 of them up there. And uh, when I found one that didn't look like it was inhabited, I just parked in there, you know, went through the little lock. The lock can't keep anybody out. Um, and went into one of the, the little cabins and kind of made myself home, at home for a few days and uh, they're again thinking in the back of my mind I'm sure I'm going to seek God up here but God was nowhere in my conscience at that point everything else was and uh, so I was up there for about I guess it was three or four days by myself and uh, one day I woke up to giggling voices of some young people that I had encountered one time year or so before accidentally and they were saying there she is there she is and you know I'm brutally awakened I probably drank half the night and, and so all of a sudden it's like what and I started grabbing whatever stuff I could to get out of there because here now this church was having their family camp at that particular camp go figure see if there's no coincidence with God yeah, yeah. Uh, God has our life planned out if we hear his voice and follow his direction yeah. we we can have whatever yep. he possesses he's given it to us and uh, so there's no such thing as a long story short Josh can tell you this uh, I've given my testimony so many times, and I leave out different portions, but the thing that, that of course, it shocked me, I want to get out of there, but when I found out that it was the same church group of people that at one time 
riding with my friends on the bikes, they used to roust about, roust this church. Mm. When they were having church, they'd drive around and rawr, 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 make the noise, throw beer bottles up against this back, you know, big thrill, yeah. Uh, and then, I never really understood why they had done that, but then another time we came by and somebody suggested, well, uh, nobody's been able from our group to go in that church and have 25 minutes in there without coming out. <laughs> and back, I mean, I'm talking back in the early 60s. Yeah. So uh, they said, well, anybody that could go in there and stay for the <laughs> a, a lot amount of time would give you $25,000, not $25, not $1,000. Uh-huh. But back then, it was a lot of money. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, knowing my background that I did, I was well, I was raised in church, man. You know, yeah. of course, I didn't want them to know that. And uh, so I took them up on it. I says, I could use the bucks. And so this one particular night, uh, it was my turn. And I went into the church, and I sat way back on the back. Of course, I didn't look like any of them. You know, I had some leather on and <laughs> uh, the smell of smoke <laughs> reeking from the body and and uh, no joy, just absolute sadness, emptiness. But I was counting on that, that buck, so I was kind of watching and uh, waiting to stay. And they were clocking me out there, and I'm thinking, oh, man, it's got to be at least 20 minutes. It was three. And so, <laughs> you know, I'm white-knuckling it and... Uh, hanging on to the seats in front of me because they started having the youth choir mm. come in and sing. And they didn't just sing. They had uh, a program on Saturday night on Cards Radio every Saturday night. It was called The Light in the Night. And the whole choir would sing. Now, we're talking Pentecostal choir. Mm-hmm. I mean, type where your hair is up on your head and, <laughs> and by the end of the the night you were shaking it down and yeah. uh, they felt the presence of God and I did too but I didn't recognize it mm-hmm. you know ever since Charles McCatton asked me to leave the church and leave his boys alone and that's a whole nother story uh, and I really went into full blown rebellion then but now I'm in over my head I'm wanting to get bucks and I wanted to prove to this idiots out there that hey anybody can come into a church and sit there for 25 minutes and when the choir started singing to the young people my age 19, 20, 25 and excuse me if I break down but it's very intimate with me how God started paving the way for me to come home And as they were singing, I felt the presence of, well, I know now it was the Holy Spirit. As they called it, the Holy Ghost came upon me. And uh, after a while, it was like I'm I'm watching people my age with joy. I mean, they were happy singing these songs, you know. And, and of course, I've always loved music. And uh, the assistant pastor of the church played the big bass, the one that's up like this, you know, he has to hold it up. And and he would, like Elvis, have his one leg going back and forth <laughs> and stomping and, you know, he's helping to lead the choir. And so, I mean, I'm enjoying the music, but what is this that I'm feeling? And so I, I finally got up and I ran out. All to a lot of laughter and ha, 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 we did, we knew it, we knew it because some of them had already gone through it. And uh, then we left. And from what they told me, matter of fact, I have the Bible in my hand now that three of the teenagers gave me after they found me in that camp and God got a hold of me. And uh, (laughs) the pastor stopped the service, the, the young guy on the base who was assistant pastor. And he says, God just told me that we're to pray for that young woman. And they started praying for me. 
And it seemed like then for the next eight months, everywhere I went, somebody from that church was there. Wow. And they would go back and report. We saw her. And then another time, oh, we finally found out her name. And I didn't go by Barbara. I went by Jackie, my last name, Jackie. And that was because in eighth grade, there were five Barbaras. And we all had to take, you know, Babs was gone, Barbie was gone, Barbara was gone, BJ was gone. Barbara <laughs> Joe was gone, Barbara this. And so <laughs> I just said, well, name. I'll just be Jackie, you know, as a nickname. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm out there, and he says, well, pray. And then the girls, the teenage girls would, uh, well, let me just back up just a moment. I, I'm not used to this kind of thing, but I'm <laughs> just going to tell my story. And uh, uh, so anyway, the thing that I wanted to do when I was 14 that my parents wouldn't let me was play professional softball. Mm -hmm. I was good. And a farm team had contacted me and said that we could take you on and, and train you and you could actually, and they were going to pay me. But because I was underage, I had to have my parents' permission. So that story now, we'll close that door. Uh, that broke my heart, took away my dream, and that's when I said, that's it. So now this pastor stops the service, and he tells me, I mean, they, he tells his group, he says, we're going to pray for her, and every time you see her, then we want you to, you know, let us know so we know how to pray. Well, I love baseball, softball, and so the ones that we rode the bikes with would always stop at the baseball diamonds when they were their game. And uh, they had a team called the Budweiser team that they supported. And, or we, but it was really they. Uh, I was wanting to, to get, get out of there, but... Uh, that particular week, we're setting up in the bleachers. The, our team, the Budweiser team, is playing against the church team. <laughs> that happened to be the church where wow. they stopped the service and said, we're going to pray for her. Amazing. And so it was like I couldn't get away no matter what I did. Okay, now fast forward. I'm ready to kill myself. Literally, I had a suicidal spirit on me. I was empty. I was looking for something. I go up to Prescott, and now we've got the church coming. And you know what church that was that happened to be having just, of all the 30 camps in the Prescott area, <laughs> the one particular one I chose happened to have been the one that they had rented in advance for their family camp. Wow. And so I'm on the bunk, and the girls are teenagers, because that was where they were sitting, the girls. And they're, they're kind of giggling, but they're going, there she is. There she is. And one of them ran out, told the pastor's wife, the pastor, and, and they're all going, wow, she's here. And, uh, of course, at that time, you don't want to be touched. You don't want, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> but I'd been up there for several days, and, and I loved to eat, and I was running out of any food that I had. And they said, well, we're going to have lunch in a little bit. Why don't you just come and be our guest? And I fought it for a while, but the smell of that cafeteria of food just, it drew me. So I went and made the biggest mistake of my life. Hmm. I had dinner with them, and then it became a regular thing for the next three days. And finally, they threatened me, some of the teenagers did, said, you haven't been coming to any of our tabernacle meetings. And I just said, no, I won't. And they said, well, we dare you. <laughs> well, at that point, uh, I was a Jackson, okay? And Jacksons were known for their competitive, stubborn spirits. <laughs> and uh, so I said, nah, that's okay, I'm okay. We double dared. And then one of the teenagers, we double dog dare you. Well, that was the final thing. And I said, oh, piece of cake, okay. And so I went to the meeting that night, and it, we, there was about 20 young people in this big tabernacle. So they're having their youth service. And I'm sitting there, and I'm kind of okay with that. And then all of a sudden, 
it was getting to the place where I'm starting to white knuckle it again. And I looked behind me and the whole sanctuary is full. They never dismissed the youth. The rest of the body just came in. And I'm sitting down now about the third row with these young people. And guess what starts happening? Here comes the choir singing. And that did it for me. I mean, I probably ran out. I don't remember tears, but I got up from my seat. I didn't care what was going on, and I ran out of the tabernacle. It was one of those long, you know, takes you. The bride could come down, and yeah. the whole song be sung before you got down to the the beginning. And when I ran out, it was like, okay, I got a breath of fresh air, but I couldn't stay out. So there was this drawing that kept bringing me in. And uh, the report was this afterwards, and I'm sure it's exaggerated a little bit over the last 53 years. <laughs> but they said that I came in and out about 13 times. <laughs> I couldn't come in, but I couldn't stay away. Yeah. And uh, the final trip in, I was sitting on the very back row, just all by myself, nobody there. And the pastor's wife walked back up there behind me and she says, you want to go up there, don't you? Because by now they're calling for people to get healed and there's some up there dancing Pentecostal style, but dancing their hair down. And <laughs> young people are kneeling at the altar. There's a lot of stuff going on. And I'm kind of watching this going, wow. And uh, so at the same time that she said, why don't you come up there with me? I shook my head no as all of a sudden I was standing on my feet. It was like something compelled me. And I, I love the scripture now that says that it was the Lord that compels us. Yeah. The Holy Spirit calls us because we are all God's children and he's planned before the foundations of the earth who we're to be and what we're to be, it's our decision to find that out. Right. And he doesn't force us to be whatever it is that he's planned, but we discover it. And a lot of times we think, wow, look at me. Look what I did. <laughs> and yeah. it was God all along. And so uh, here's the bottom line. I stood up and started walking down the aisle with the pastor's wife and when I got up there, of course, here's the associate pastor who plays the bass, okay? And he's up there, and he turns around, and he sees me coming, and about half of the old lady, next generation, former generation, prayer warriors that had their hair stuck up like this, and uh, outside holiness, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, immediately they were the intercessors, so pastors watch it and you know be come down here come they're getting up on their feet now and gonna uh, not ring around the rosy but you know what I mean they gathered around me real fast and uh, pastor after a, a couple of times asking me if I wanted to give my life to the Lord and I kept saying no 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 but the last time he says well God loves you God's got a plan for your life zero in now Baseball. Yeah, God's got a plan for my life. Sure, you know. But I was desperate enough that I remember just clenching my fist and saying, God, if you're up there and you could do something with me, then do it and do it now. The last thing I remember for four hours on the floor. Wow. And during that time, deliverance was taking place these old women jump on you like a, an ant on food, you know what I mean? And uh, they prayed me through. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, wow. which was against their doctrine because you, according to them, to or be able to speak in tongues and get the, they didn't call it a baptism, but the Holy Ghost. You had to be baptized yeah. in water first. Well, they didn't know I'd been <laughs> baptized at the Baptist church, but <laughs> uh, so they thought that I had it backward and kind of blew their mind. And uh, uh, after that, getting up off the floor, I was a different person. 
I looked at people. I mean, I couldn't keep my hands off. I wanted to hug everybody. It was uh, instant love, like I had been washed and cleansed and, and wrung out to dry, and the wind blew and got it all clean, and uh, it was an encounter that I will never forget, and it has become my life. And while I was underneath the piano for some of those four hours, at least I guess that's where eventually my body wound up, I heard the voice of God. Not audibly, but I heard it as strong as if you were talking to me right here. And I heard the voice say, Barbara, will you serve me? And it was irresistible. It yeah. was it was like not asking me a question, but basically proclaiming that I would. And I remember saying to the Lord, verbally it was like somebody was watching they thought I was crazy talking to nobody but I said yes Lord I will serve you the rest of my life the end but don't you ever fail me sorry <laughs> and so one of my favorite songs that recently I've learned is I will sing of the goodness of God yeah all my life he has been faithful to me. All my life he has been so, so good. With every breath that I'm able, I will sing of the goodness of my God. Yeah. And that was my dedication, and it was such a strong dedication that I for well, I, what's the word, forego? Uh, or walked away from three engagements to be married, I, I felt like I, I've got the best husband in the world right now. Why would I throw him over for another one? <laughs> this one I can trust. Yeah. And, and I had seen over the years, I mean, I wasn't a, a child, you know, in my 20s. Uh, so it was like I already got a husband. Hmm. Not that I was Catholic and went through the Bride of Christ ceremonies, but he was my husband. He is my husband. He is my everything. But everything that I didn't get by being married, God has, and that's what I love about him. You never go without anything when you trust him. I never married, so I never, you know, knew what it was to live with a man in a godly style and trust him for whatever and God started bringing young men and their wives and into my life after I got up off of the ground at that camp meeting and told the Lord I'd serve him within six months God had opened a miraculous door for me to go to Bible college and uh, to train for ministry, which I always wanted. At that time, I couldn't care less or hadn't really heard that a woman can't do it. You know, <laughs> if God's in me, I'm going to do it, bless God. You know, I mean, I had that kind of stubbornness type thing. Yeah. But at the same time, it was my calling. I knew it was. And uh, so I entered Bible college six months after that experience with God. And one of my professors his name was Dr. Bill Hammond at that time he wasn't a doctor but Bill Hammond and his wife Evelyn were teachers at the college and uh, they were also counselors on campus and uh, sure enough I had still some areas to be counseled things to get over you know, because I've had this miraculous experience, but it's kind of like uh, when you go fishing, you catch the fish, but you don't immediately eat it. You've got to clean it up first. <laughs> and God wanted to use me, you know, as bait for people to come to Christ. Yeah. But at the same time, I needed to be cleaned up in a lot of areas. So sure enough, who do I pick or who do I get? as my counselor 
with Bill and Evelyn Hanley. And uh, in the summertime, I stayed in their home, lived with them in between semesters. And uh, through everything they went through with me over the, the next uh, three to four years in college, they left on my third year and went out and followed God in another area. But I was part of the family by that time. I had caught C A C A U G H T more than I was taught yeah. from Bill and Evelyn Hamlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, he was known at the Bible College as the Dancing Prophet. Mm -hmm. And uh, sure enough, he, he's been a prophet for ever since he was a teenager. He's got his own testimony. But I became a part of them at that point and uh, never really left them. Even though they were in Texas, I left Texas after graduation where the Bible College was and went home to Arizona. Well, about 10 years later, here come the Hammonds to Arizona, you know, and so it was like the connection's always been there. So <laughs> uh, long story short, which there's no such, no such thing, and I don't know what the time is You're going fine. here. But uh, he emulated, I guess is the word, in front of me, what a true man of God could be. And I mean, when you are in somebody's home day and night, and you know, uh, you, you really get to know who they are and what they are. And uh, I just fell in love with them. And, uh, when I left Bible College after graduation, I was ordained. Uh, I started going into the ministry, having Bible studies here and there, just starting out, and uh, didn't know, no desire to pastor a church. Oh, Lord, have mercy, you know. But to teach the Word, to evangelize the Word, and I was notorious after getting saved of picking up hitchhikers. And this was way back in the 60s. We don't do that today. No. Uh, but I would pick them up, and they'd say, well, how far are you going? I said, well, how far are you going? And I'd take them the whole way and give them my testimony on the way. Wow. And so many times, I led them to the Lord, but then where do you go from there? I would go over to, and this is back now when I'm first getting saved, over to the pastor's house, sometimes 2 o'clock in the morning, knock on the door and say, hey, this person needs to get saved. And after a while, and I'm going to tell you the name of the pastor in the church that I got saved in. I wish it had been Gospel Echoes, but uh, my parents still went there. My dad was one of the elders years ago. My mother babysat John McCaffrey, mm -hmm. and I helped her. And so we've always had this thing that, hey, I diapered you when you were a baby. Mm -hmm. And, of course, John and all the McCattons now are our, our family, second second family, really. And uh, we've known each other forever. But the name of the pastor of the church that I got saved in, the name of the church was the Jesus Name Church. Mm -hmm. And they were Pentecostal apostolic. Apostolic just means that you have long hair, <laughs> I remember the first, uh, the first probably month that I was there before I went to Texas to Bible College. Every time the pastor's wife would come and hug me, she would do this, "Hi, honey, how are you?" to see if my hair had been cut. You know, I mean that that was the only flaw that I really could see. A heart of love, intercession. These people would seek and tarry at the altar for hours and hours, seeking the Lord. Well. Rebellion in me, Linda. <laughs> was it okay? Well, I was the same. I, I joined the choir temporarily and got kicked out of the choir one Sunday because somebody from the church had driven by where I lived in a mobile park and saw me out mowing the lawn in cut off jean shorts. And you didn't wear jeans or shorts. Mm -hmm. Men's and clothes, so they'd say back then, right? They would not <coughs> let me sing that particular week till I repented and got saved again. That's why I was born but in this era where I can wear pants. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way it should be. Uh, we should be able to choose, I believe. <laughs> and, and, and they're different anyway, even though they're pants. I got on women's slacks 
it, it looked ridiculous yeah, on, on Pastor Britt or, or <laughs> Pastor Josh. I mean, just no, no way. Josh, you know. Josh we should try that on him. the break, Josh. Yeah. Yeah. Try that. <laughs> I think Josh could rock it. But the name of the pastor was Jimmy Outlaw. Oh, wow. Okay. That's he, a cool And name. his father was James Outlaw, the first. Okay. And so coming from where I was at the time to come to a church where the pastor's name is Outlaw, and God start calling me back, you know, through them that had uh, a heart for the souls. I mean, that you got to get saved. I mean, that was just all there was to it. And um, so I went into the ministry and have been in the ministry ever since. I've been everywhere. <laughs> I, I've been associate pastor, youth pastor. I've been uh, activities director. I've been uh, the pastor. I even birthed. Uh, and pioneered two churches in Nebraska wow. and, and, and one here in Arizona before God led me to uh, really get my passion because when Bill Hammond started in 1988 in his ministry to birth the prophetic and hear the voice of God, he called me up and said, you've got to come to a conference. I want to reordain you under the company of the prophets. Wow and apostles and so I, I flew out to Christ, Christ International in Florida and uh, that night was very special after the service they, they reordained me and uh, words came over me from prophetic words and I knew they were God and I'm going to let you know in just a second how I know the voice of God is that it was prophesied over me that God says, I'm going to open up parts of the world to you, and you're going to go into this country and this country and this country, and you're, you're going to shine for me, you're going to do this, you're going to do that. And when I'm hearing it, of course, I'm broken. <laughs> you can see how easy it breaks when I talk about my Jesus. But the prophetic word didn't really sink in until... I'm doing a woman's conference one time in Texas to a group of people in church. I don't know how they found my name. And after the service, of course, Bill Hammond always taught us, if you preach for an hour, then you've got to pray over people and prophesy for an hour. And so we did. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it'd be two and three and four hours. They'd carry us out because we were so weary from ministering to God's people mm. so that they might know that God loves them and he is exhorting them now, giving them comfort, edifying them, building it up that you can do all things through Christ. Yeah. And uh, so the prophetic word really meant, and, and those things except one country in, in the last 30 years has come to pass. The only country I've not been in yet that was prophesied over me is Australia. Hmm. And until I go to Australia, I'm not dying. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're holding off on Australia then? Well, I tell you what, <laughs> I, I've already got some connections, but yeah, it, it, that would be the, the human thing to do, wouldn't <laughs> yeah. it? Uh, but I was struck down in 1997 with cancer. And uh, it was stage four, and they gave me maybe two years if I had the radiation, the chemo, the whole thing, the double mastectomy, and, and the lymph nodes and everything. It was everywhere. And uh, I felt like, well, it's not my time. Mm -hmm. So I stood on that prophetic word, that voice that God spoke to me through the prophet that Australia is a country. And the whole time I'm going through the cancer, Josh was about six years old, I think, at that time. And uh, my apartment was right above theirs. And so we ate together, we played together, we swam together, we, we were together. Mm -hmm. And I had already started the School of the Holy Spirit, which is the whole purpose was to equip the saints to do the work of ministry. Because as Josh read in the very beginning, 1 Corinthians 12, the first verse says, I would not that you be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I hate ignorance. 
And I was told once that usually the thing that you hate or can't stand or want to change somewhere is part of your calling, part of your passion. And so I began to teach the word, and I'd learned the word and got my theology degree in Bible college and found out I could memorize the word, and it, it was just, like, astounding to me because growing up underneath my older brother, I didn't feel like I could do anything right. Yeah, it was, it's pretty crazy when I grew up with, with Barb. Um, one thing that blew your mind is she would have her Bible with her but she would never have to open it or even look at it to preach or teach or say every scripture was memorized. And if you ever went to a service with Barb, you would sit down and the preacher would say, what scripture? And as the preacher is quoting the scripture, so is Barb out loud next to you. Everyone. There wasn't a one that she missed. It was, it was as if the entire Bible was inside Barb. And it was like, how in the world like it was it, it was one of the most amazing things well you know that that was a gift of the memory but along with it is i fell in love with the author yeah and uh, he signed my book <laughs> and so i love the word john first chapter says in the beginning was the word the word was with god the word was God. Mm -hmm. How do we know the voice of God? So many voices speaking to us everywhere. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know we've got another segment coming and I don't want to dominate everything, but I have this thing and, and if you will help me hold the Bible sideways to you like that okay. and then grab the inside there and the bottom and now fold it halfway and back and back and back. If you want to hear the voice of God, open his mouth. Yeah. Yeah. That's the mouth of God. Yeah. People that, that say, well, I'm not sure if, 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 if it's really God. I got this word. I got this thought. It came to me. Is it the right? Well, if it's in here, it's the right word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is the final judgment of all things. The Bible says it's the more sure word yeah. of prophecy. Yep. And prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. It is. We want Jesus to testify. Yeah. And he uses us humans to do it. But if we don't know his voice, yep. as his sheep, we are supposed to. A real sheep knows the voice of God. But back to, can you lead a horse to water and make him drink? Put salt on his tongue same way about the sheep you have to know something about the relationship of sheep to the shepherd and I went to Bible college the third year with a guy named Harry and he was from Idaho and they were shepherds up there and we were talking about that you're fine with that now <laughs> you can hold his mouth over all you want you know and, uh, and that way I know that I know that I know mm -hmm. I've heard his voice because it's in here. And everything I do, like John said, it's it, I've got to, you know, you can preach and teach all you want, but if it's not in here, brother, right. I don't have to believe you, yeah. you know, and the same with me. And, uh, but the shepherd, he, he was teaching. We were talking, John 10, talking about the sheep knowing the voice and another they will not follow. And he got up in front of the class and he said, well, my dad and my family have been shepherds forever and we have you know the sheep and he started explaining the intimacy that the shepherd has with the sheep the bible says he knows them all by name it goes beyond that for us he knows every hair on your neck that everything that the shepherd has he gives to the sheep to eat in fine pasture, to lie down in cool waters, and to meet with him at nighttime. And this is what Charlie said, Charlie Harris. He said, at nighttime, when all the sheep have been called in and the sheep dog, you know, helps bring them in, they've got this, this corral, and then they've got a segment of the corral, small little part, over on the side, where he's got the shepherd's crook, 
looks like a big cane. And as the sheep pass by one by one, he examines them to see if they were in a thorn bush. Did they get cut? Did they fall down off of a cliff and break something? You know, and, and so every intimate thing, the shepherd checks every night when they call him in. And if they have some kind of an owie, <laughs> we'll just put it that way, he drops that crook on the back part of their neck here, and immediately those sheep notes, they sheep notes go to the area over here that's reserved for later. Wow. And he lets the other sheep go through into the actual corral. And then after that's all done and he's secured the number, he counts them. And if there's one that is not there, the Bible says he leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. And when he finds that one, he carries it in his bosom to the outer pen and goes and has that intimate healing with each one of them. There's a balm that they used to use to put on the sheep <coughs> to heal all the wounds in that. And those sheep know him so well because of that relationship, that intimacy, that they won't follow another. And that's why the Bible says and uses that illustration, Jesus is the great shepherd, mm -hmm. that his sheep know his voice. Yeah. Because we have been healed. We have been ministered unto. We've been mended. Mm -hmm. Whether we've got a broken heart, whether we've got emotional problems, whether we've got a deep, deep, deep hurt, whether it's physical, the shepherd knows if we will only come and be counted. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that, that Charlie Harris said about that he says all of us are supposed to follow the shepherd and we do you know Psalm 23 and it says that we don't have need of anything if we follow the shepherd but he said that as the shepherd would walk from place to place from pasture to pasture during the day and that the sheep would follow him you know, when you've got 99 sheep, not all of them can be real close. And he said that what would happen is that the shepherd would go like under an apple tree and, and pick an apple or something, and he'd hold it right, you know, off of his left or right hip in a cup type thing like this. And that the ones that were following the closest got the goodies. <laughs> the ones that were still back in the group didn't even know anything about it wow. because they weren't following closely enough. Mm. Beautiful. And you know, that stuck with me all these years. It's been 53, well more than that since Bible college years. And I've always wanted to be the sheep that got the goodies. Now I'm not saying I, did, I haven't struggled. I, I've had times where I wanted to backslide. You know, when, when you get angry with God that it doesn't work out in your time and your way and the way you want it. And uh, I, I did that when my baby sister died at age 14 and uh, didn't understand why God didn't heal her. And automatically there can be that hardness of heart. But that's why when you open God's mouth, he talks about all this and what to do. Don't let bitterness, don't let a situation, don't let a trouble come between you and the shepherd. Yeah. When you're broken, when you're hurting, when you're discouraged, go to the shepherd. Yeah. And this is the voice of God. <laughs> and it, the more you know it, the clearer you're going to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Well, before we go to break, is there if I ask something? Yeah. Open up something, just curious what your thoughts are. Because I see pretty much when I was thinking about this as you're talking, I, I see kind of two errors that I see, like mainstream errors in the church today. And it's not new errors. I mean, there's always been yeah, errors in the I, body. I but yeah. one group of people would say, I just want to hear the voice of God, but I don't have devotion to God. Like, I don't need his word. I just want him to speak to me, which, which I mean, if we have 
we want his word without devotion, I think, you know, we end up like Saul. Yes. Thinking, I just, you know, I just need to hear from God and I haven't heard, so I'm going to go to a medium and I'm going to find something. Uh -huh. And then you have David, on the other hand, who said, I just want God. That's and it. in his devotion, he heard God's voice. Yes. And so it wasn't like, God wasn't a means to an end for David. And so, so he needed the word. And then the other school of thought and error would say, I just need the word. God doesn't speak uh -huh. individually. I have his word. And so some that reject the word and others that reject the, what we'd say, the rhema word, because the logos is the written the word of God. The rhema the logos, is the yeah. individual word in a specific time uh -huh. for a specific means. So what would you say to people who, who would, why is it so necessary to hear God's word specifically for, for us? Okay, well, throughout God's interaction with man since Adam and Eve fell, they have and God has set different means for them to follow him. You know, you had the patriots, and then you had the judges, and then you had the kings, and, and none of them were the shepherds, you yeah. know what I mean? And so it failed, And but God from the very beginning knew that he was going to sacrifice his son because he knows the beginning from the end. And so when Jesus came, he fulfilled the law that said that you've got to be under the kings or under the judges or under this, the Ten Commandments that was given to Moses. But he fulfilled them. He didn't do away with them. Right. And so the part of the devotion is that, and I read in the book of Revelation, that he that overcometh will get this, will be rewarded, will do this, yeah. the overcomer. And there are so many people that never understand that they have got to overcome the selfishness hmm. that they want. I want it my way when I want it, and then I want to do what I want to do. My mother taught me one scripture years and years and years ago. And she says either, and it's not really a scripture, but she says either sin will keep you from this book, or this book will keep you from sin. Because this book is not just a book. This book is God mm -hmm. incarnate, yeah. given to us as the Logos. But that means that he still has the rhema, the personal word, that is a revelation of right. the word. Mm -hmm. And so we need the both. Yep. And uh, if you can't do away with one, like there's some denominations that take the whole book of Acts out of the Bible. Never read it, never teach on it. You know, say it's it's false, it's not for today, etc., etc. Well, my Bible says, and I have to go back to what God said. If you take away any part or add any part to this, you're guilty of help. Hmm. And so we've got to take it serious that we're not playing with God. God is the Almighty. He is the Creator of the universes. Hmm. Not just the creator of man. He is everything and was everything without us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but chose to have a family. And so in order to have a family, he had to, something had to die. You know, when it says the seed goes into the ground and yeah. lest it die, it abideth alone. And that's a principle of God's word. So he planted his son for us. And those that receive that seed yeah. become the family of God. And that's all God's interest in. The greatest, most precious thing to the heart of God since Jesus came is his church. I'm talking to, talking to the ecclesia, yeah. the called out ones, not the, uh, the corner building, yeah. but the actual church that believes. And that's what's got to be discipled in both of these groups that you're mentioning. Yeah. Whether or not they want to go deeper or they just want to hear God say, hey, I heard God speak one day. Yeah, and the heartbreaking thing is, even those that say, I don't think God speaks, the very fact that you came into a relationship with God means that you heard the voice of God because we can't come unless he draws us. Unless so, the Spirit draws. That's so right. if you even have a relationship with God, you already heard him speak and you responded. That's it. So it's like, I don't know, it's just hard. But yeah, like you said, it's the ignorance of not knowing. Mm -hmm. 
And I think you had like a moment where you had to learn for yourself. You were under your dad and I had the same upbringing in church and I had to figure it out myself. And I think everybody has to come to this moment where it's no longer Moses telling me, this is what God's saying. This is what you need to do. This is what the Bible says. And you come out from under Moses and meet Jesus personally. And he, as a shepherd, as someone who speaks to me, Yes. And that changed everything for me and you too, uh-huh. you know? And so it's like, it's heartbreaking to watch people say, oh, he doesn't speak. I, I just abide by his word. And I'm like, that's, we should do but that. But that is him speaking. Right. Open his mouth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that thing, I, uh, I question. Now, there again, I'm not God. But I do question a, a person's lack of devotion or commitment when they say I received the Lord or I got saved because as Peter even said that his newborn babe desire the milk of the word in other words if there's no desire for this you're either born dead (laughs) or you've got some problems your heart is not fully developed or uh, you've been aborted or you know these type of things that uh, the analogies of the natural because we are a body mm-hmm. many times we just see it in the scripture that if we are truly newborn babes we desire that word but the hunger has still got to come from the salt mm-hmm. the thirst mm-hmm. you know when David said as the the deer panted for the water brook so I pant and I thirst for you know the Lord the presence of God once you really receive it the water you want more and if not you're going to die and uh, I had somebody say one time it says that seven days makes one week seven days without the word makes one week and you can make some memes with these sayings she's got I know well (laughs) after so many years and I'm sure many of it I've heard and adopted from others and and then use your own analogies but those are the things that stick with a person sure and the same way about the voice of God and there are modern day prophets today as there are apostles Ephesians 4, and I know that time is We're fine. We're, probably. We'll, we'll go a couple but, more minutes and then we'll uh, come back. Yeah, Ephesians 4 talks about that these are the days when God does and did at Calvary impart gifts mm. to men. The apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Yeah. And that's called the mighty hand of God as far as I'm concerned. Mm. We have the apostle. He can touch every one of us. We have the prophet, he points. We have the evangelist, the furthest out reaching. We have the pastor who's married to the church, the wing finger. And we have the teacher who brings the balance of the word. Because you have to have foundation with the word. You have to have doctrine. But it's the doctrine of Christ, not the doctrine of the modern day or even the past years it's what did Christ say yeah beautiful I and loved so, it I loved it would you um Barb as we're going because I kind of felt this earlier and I, I don't want to miss an opportunity um but as the heart of God began to minister through you a minute ago about the shepherd and going after and, yes. and being able to be intimate with those close and being able to examine would you just pray quickly pray for those that are listening to this in that regard and and then we can take a quick break and come back in. But would you just pray for them and, and seal this session with about with that? Well, sure. Father God, in Jesus' mighty name, we come to you. And Lord, we sense your presence in this room and over this podcast. Because God, you said that we're two or three are gathered in your name. There you are in our midst. And we know that you dealt, dwell with us and you walk and you talk with us. But, Lord, there are so many that don't have that relationship. They don't have that faith because the Word has not brought it to them in the revelation. 
of how you are the great shepherd and that you care for your sheep and that whenever we're searching for something we don't have, instead of going to this and that and, and finding love in all the wrong places, Lord, we need to come to the shepherd that cares for the sheep and will heal all the bruises and all the brokenness and mend us and put us back in the greater family of God. And so, Lord, we call forth the hunger and the thirst, Lord God, that we as sheep, as people, need to have for you, God, for the great shepherd that loves us, loves us so much you gave your own life for us. And as you've even spoken in your word that there's no greater love hath any man than he give his life for his brother. Lord, you gave us everything. And so, Lord, help us to know how to put salt on the tongue of those that are following a long way off and do not know of the precious goodies and intimacy that you have for them. You know everything about them, counted the hairs on their head. The Bible says before you were even formed in our womb, you knew us. And Lord God, that's a revelation. That's the rhema that we need to hear. And as prophets that speak the voice of the Lord, it's to encourage, to edify, and to comfort the hearer. And so, Lord God, in this prayer, we send forth that encouragement, that edification, and that comfort, Lord God. And that should cover both past, present, and future if we just cry out to you. So, Lord God, bring the hunger and let us be the salt and light that causes them to drink. And I thank you for it, Lord. We declare and decree it done in Jesus' name that there's going to be that David crying out as the deer that panteth after the water brooks. So we pant after you, Lord. We thank you for it. Amen. Amen. So good, Barb. So good. Thank you. That was so awesome. Yeah. You, um, get, you know, you made the mistake <laughs> no, of putting no. the mic in front no, of a person. No, it's not a mistake. No, no I'm saying... You never give a mic to a preacher. Yeah. <laughs> they just never get it back. <laughs> well, but, we're in good company. That's all that matters. Yeah, and that's so true. thank and, you. And, and I know each of us have our own testimony and how we got to where yeah. we are. And But uh, it's not often that, that we really share, you know, what love. And, you know, that word intimacy, I never really understood what it meant. Mm. You know, but it has to come with trust and faith. And one day I heard somebody, I don't know if it was a preacher or someone else, say, all that intimacy is, is that you allow God to into me see. Let the shepherd see the bruises and the brokenness and, and come to him that can mend you and make you whole again. It's so good. We're going to take about a five, ten minute break. We're going to start part two and... And uh, we're going to continue this, this discussion. And uh, thanks for joining us at his roundtable. <laughs>